Good evening, HPC and the City Pandemics participants, hackers, faculty, researchers, and welcome to our kickoff for this amazing event that we have annually, uh, along with uh, Supercomputing 23. Um, this year, we are focusing on pandemics. We're bringing together specialists from the high-performance computing community, along with the uh, cyber infrastructure community and the dis uh, pandemics decision science community to have a focus on uh, pandemic-related data sets. We have our mentors ready tonight to do their pitches. We have Omnibon here tonight, ready to give us a little bit of information about Project Eureka. We have some of our judges here tonight. And before we get started, I just wanna say to everybody, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Thank you for the work that uh, uh, the mentors have put in in the beginning, uh, the students that have put in with our pre-training events and whatnot, and the work they'll be putting in over the course of this weekend. We're ready to have a good time. So let's go ahead and push forward here. By first taking a moment to introduce some of the organizers of this amazing event. Um, I'm gonna start in the top left and kind of work my way through. Um, I'm gonna start with Dr. Linda Hayden. Dr. Hayden, hey. would you mind saying hello to everyone? Hello everyone, glad to see you out tonight for our kickoff meeting for our Hack in the City pandemic. Looking forward to working with you over the next few days. Thank you, Doc. And up next is actually Dr. Lauren Ansel Myers. Uh, Dr. Myers, were you able to make it tonight? I know she is on. She is getting a lot of work done here recently. It doesn't look like she was able to make this meeting. That is okay, because we'll go to our other uh, organ, one of our other organizers, who's also a part of the leadership team at the Texas Advanced Computing Center, uh, one of my direct mentors, uh, uh, Dr. Kelly Gaither. Kelly, would you mind saying hello? Hey, everybody. Excited to work with you guys uh, over the next couple of days. Thanks, Kelly. And up next, we, we call her the heart of our organization of Hack HPC. Uh, we want to take a moment and Amy Cannon, would you mind saying hello from Omnibon? Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining the Hackathon this year. And we are so excited that you're here. And please let us know if you need anything from us and just email us or call us. We'll be there for you. Thanks, Amy. I appreciate that. And then we come to me. Uh, apparently, I will be your host with the most. My name is Jamie Powell. I'm very glad to be here. I'm a systems administrator from the Texas Advanced Computing Center in the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I am really happy to be here. And just to echo Amy, any way we can help, we're here to help you. You're going to hear me say this again and again and again. We're family here. We are here to support you. Which leads me on to Boyd Wilson, one of our longtime supporters of uh, Hack HPC from back in the beginning. Boyd, would you mind saying hello? Hello and welcome, everyone. And looking forward to meeting everyone through this weekend. So, so excited. Excellent. And Boyd, you're going to hear a little bit more from Boyd. Uh, in a moment when he tells us a little bit about Project Eureka, one of, his, one of Omnibond's new products that's coming out that I am extremely excited about. Um, uh, additionally, we, uh, Mr. Alex, no, uh, now Alex is actually a researcher of hackathons and team events uh, from the University of Tartu in Estonia. And right now we want to kind of send out some good thoughts his way because he isn't feeling too well um, but we will hear from him during this event. We kind of pre-recorded him. Uh, so Alex, uh, again, one of our essential parts of our group, which leads us to my, my brother, Charlie, who is also one of my coworkers. Charlie, would you like to say hello? Hey, everyone. So yeah, this is a, always an awesome event. This is always a lot of fun and it's always a lot of work. But uh, you know, at the end of it, it usually all works out just fine. <laughs> Especially so thanks, since Charlie. we've already had our hiccup, we're good to go. So welcome, right. everyone. Looking forward to working with y'all. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to, to, to take great pride in introducing one of our newest organizers and parts of, of Hack HPC. He actually began as an undergraduate student, just like many of you all, uh, from a Winston, Winston-Salem State University, Mr. Hector Santiago. Hector, you want to say hello? 
Sure. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, like pretty much uh, everybody I've said so far, um, just have fun and, and reach out if you have any questions and you know we're happy to help you. Yes. Now, I want to say for Hector, we all need to be a little jealous of Hector because Hector is about to board a plane tomorrow to head to Switzerland. Well, that's fine. That's fine. You can go to Switzerland. As soon as you get there, we still want you on U.S. time to join. No. <laughs> we're we're, we'll we're glad to have you, Hector. Hector, we like chocolate. Yes, yes, we do. I'll, I'll bring you. Some. you. I'll bring you some. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, having said that, I just want you to have an idea of what's going to happen tonight. Uh, for many of you, this may be your first hackathon. So tonight's going to seem a little chaotic. And let me let you know that some of that chaos is built in. Uh, but don't worry, I want you to know again, we're here to support you. We're family here. We will make sure that uh, we get you taken care of. Yeah, so um, so at the end of the hack, you have to pick which chaos moments were artificial and which ones were real. <laughs> That's true. Which, Charlie, you're gonna, you're gonna love this. I actually added a slide to uh, show some of that craziness, <laughs> some of that chaos that I'm actually looking forward to. And actually, before I move on, I just noticed someone that joined in, actually two people that joined, three people that joined in, that um, I just wanna take a moment and let them say hello, if you don't mind. First, I want to uh, introduce one of our, another member of our leadership team in charge of our education and outreach group, uh, Rosie Gomez. Would you like to say hello to the students and the participants? Hello, everyone, and sorry, I'm in the middle of dinner. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, Jamie, for putting this on and for the mentors and organizers. Uh, really excited to see what the students come up with, the participants over the next couple of days. Um, and I'm excited for the participants, um, especially if this is your first time participating in a hackathon. So welcome. Thanks, Rosie. And uh, also, I'd like to, to introduce one of our, she's also one of our leadership team members at the at, uh, Texas Advanced Computing Center. Uh, she is world renowned for her work in uh, APIs and uh, for really pushing the boundaries of, and by pushing the boundaries, breaking down some of the barriers of entry to high performance computing. I'd like to introduce Maytal Don. Maytal, would you like to say hello to us? Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm not on camera. I'm currently in the car, but I'm excited to have you all. Um, I am also one of the PIs on the Science Gateways Center of Excellence grant, SGC X3. Um, and there are a lot of additional student opportunities there. So I'd love to have you guys engaged um, after this hackathon. I'm very excited to um, see you guys go through this experience and hear how it goes at the end. Excellent. Thank you, Maytal. And actually, Dr. Hayden is also a part of SGX3. Mm -hmm. And she has actually posted a link in chat, which I just repeated for an opportunity for some of you all. And we'll let her talk about that a little bit later, but I just want to make, let you know it is in chat for you. And Maytal, I'll also post the link for the internships. The link you have is for the Coding Institute. Ah, no. Okay. Thank so you, Linda. Sure. Excellent. And last but not least, I have to take a moment to uh, introduce someone that um, she is a powerhouse in the field of, of, of diversity. Uh, she has helped push the boundaries of high performance computing uh, beyond what some even thought were possible at the time. And I'm also really fortunate that she has recently become one of my coworkers um, and she's also a part of a saying that I've had for a very long time. I've always said, if you have the Lindas behind you, you can do anything. The first Linda there is Dr. Linda Hayden from Elizabeth City State University and a part of SGX3. But that second Linda is Linda Ackley. Linda, would you like to say hello to everyone? Sure. I'm looking forward to this weekend and uh I will be a judge on Monday, and I always love seeing all the, the results from the work that you guys do and also know that you guys have a lot of fun in the process. So have a good hackathon. Excellent. Thank you so much, Linda, and thank you for joining us as well. All right. So before we dive in, 
I kind of flipped the side slides a little bit here because I, I figured before I went to the objectives, I want to make sure everyone is aware that we do have a code of conduct. Now, I'm going to let Alex tell you a little bit about that. Uh, this code of conduct is listed on our event site, which is hackhbc.github.io slash HPC in the city 23. Um, it's actually down at the bottom. You just click on the code of conduct as well as that QR code listed there on the screen. We'll show it to you. But just to give us a quick overview, Alex, take it away. To make sure the hackathon will be an enjoyable experience for all, we developed a code of conduct. In the next few minutes, I will walk you through the most important points of the code. You can also find it on the hackathon website. The URL is depicted in this slide. We are an inclusive event that welcomes all people, no matter their age, gender, skin color, ethnicity, nationality, religion, or background. We are dedicated to provide a harassment-free environment to everybody, and we do not tolerate harassment in any form. We expect all hackathon participants, mentors, sponsors, partners, volunteers, and staff to comply with this code of conduct. The hackathon staff may take any action they deem appropriate if the code is violated. Potential actions include sanctions, expelling people from the hackathon, or contacting law enforcement. Harassment includes but is not restricted to audio video recording against reasonable consent, sustained disruption of talks or other events, inappropriate contact and unwelcome sexual attention. Furthermore, sexual language and imagery is not appropriate at any time during the hackathon. If a situation makes you feel uncomfortable, if you witness someone being harassed or if you are a victim of harassment yourself, please contact a member of the hackathon staff immediately. They are distinguishable as organizers in Discord. You can also find their contact information under the menu point Organizers on the Hackathon website. The URL is depicted in this slide. You are of course welcome to take screenshots and pictures and share them during or after the Hackathon with your friends or on social media. You should however be aware who and what might be visible in your picture and give people a reasonable chance to opt out. To be sure, just ask yourself if you would like someone taking a picture of you in that situation before taking a picture yourself. We hope that these rules help us all to have an enjoyable hackathon. Good luck. All right, thank you, Alex. So again, those code, that code of conduct is available on our main event site, but I also wanna say any of our organizers or mentors, if there's any type of issue, please let us know. We want to make sure you feel safe. We want to make sure you feel supported. We want to make sure that you don't have any issues. So please feel free to approach any of us on the organizing committee. All of our information is located on the organizers uh, uh, tab or page on the website. If there's a concern, please let us know. To make sure the hackathon will be- Oh, Alex, we already heard from you. There we go. So- this is the only slide I'm going to read from directly, but it's because I want to make sure the points get across the way we need them to. So having said that, the hackathon objectives and student outcomes, in this case, the hackathon aims to harness the resources, skills, and knowledge found in the high-performance computing community in an effort to provide applied exposure towards students from two to four year and post-secondary educational institutions. In short, the hackathon will provide HPC skills and training while targeting problems that directly affect the participants. They'll develop knowledge and create solutions to identify pandemic decision science projects through applications of data analysis, presentation, or management using high-performance computing, HPC, or CI, Cyber Infrastructure Resources. Some of the outcomes, and you're gonna find this out. You're gonna have an increased familiarity with data science in the cloud, experience collaborative software engineering, which if you've never done it, believe you me, it's gonna be interesting. You will learn a lot with that. And you'll of course develop professional communication skills. That's right, we're gonna have you report out some of your findings. Now. We are going to have some awards now. I, I want to I want to put a point on this before I let Alex tell us about them. The purpose of even though we have a competitive side to this hackathon, we minimize it. 
our main priority, intention, and goal is to ensure that you all have the, the time and support you need to experience some of these tools uh, in an applied way. Uh, so the awards really are, they're there, but at the same time, you won't hear us talk about them very much. So, Alex, tell us what we do know, though. At the end of the hackathon, each team will be eligible to win one of the following awards. The Judge's Choice Award, the Viewer's Choice Award, or the Impact Award. I want you to note that there are no numbers in front of the awards. This is because one is not more significant than the other. And in fact, the prizes you can win are exactly the same for all three awards. Alex, why don't you tell them a little bit more? It is important to know also that you cannot win them all. We don't want to create a situation where one team is running away with all the prizes and everyone else is disappointed. After all, this is supposed to be a fun event as well as a competitive one. So let me talk a little bit about how these different awards actually work. The first one is the Judges' Choice Award. We have assembled a team of judges and each one can give a maximum of 100 points per team. They will assess your project based on three criteria. The first criterion is the creativity of execution or the wow effect. Here the judges will ask themselves how creative the execution of your project was and if you came up with new use cases, big opportunities or surprises. For this criterion you can earn up to 20 points. The second criterion is UX or polish. Here the judges will look at the design of your project and they will ask themselves is it actually easy to understand and to use and did you put some thought into the user experience. For this criterion you can earn up to 10 points. The third criterion is the technical complexity of the project. Here the judges will look at how technically impressive your hack was and they will ask themselves if the technical problem that you tackled was actually difficult and if the technology you used made them go wow. For this criterion you also can earn up to 10 points. The fourth criterion is collaboration. Here the judges will look at how well you worked together as a team. This criterion is worth up to 20 points. The fifth criterion is the presentation. At the end of the hackathon you will be asked to give a presentation about your project. And the judges here will look at if you presented a functioning solution if you stayed within the time limit of your presentation, very important, and if you were able to communicate your project and its values well. This criterion is worth up to 20 points. And then the final criterion is very simple. It's just, did you complete the challenge that you set yourself? Did you manage to do what you said you would do? Did you achieve your goals? This criterion is also worth up to 20 points. Now to the second award, which is the Viewer's Choice Award. This is very much straightforward. At the end of the hackathon, there will be a presentation session, as mentioned before. During that session, you will not only present your project to us, the other teams and the mentors, but also to other people that might want to watch the stream, like for example, your friends and family, HPC community members, sponsors or conference participants. During this session, we will share a link to a form where anyone can vote for their favorite team. At the end, we will count the votes, and the team with the most votes wins. There we go. All right. Now, you all are going to be wondering, well, what's the Impact Award? Well, the Impact Award is actually an award that we give to the team that most directly uh, uh, targets our theme. And in, in this case, our theme is pandemics. So the team that most directly uh, accomplishes uh, their, their goals towards uh, pandemic science in this case will actually be eligible for that award. No, there we go. So there are actually some, a few other teaser or shall we say minor awards that are gonna come along with that, including team introduction, project management, team trailer and progress awards, along with the others. The criteria, again, is listed there. I want you to know that those, are my, those minor awards, if you're thinking about it in terms of project management and completing your project, to kind of give you a view behind the curtain, 
We do those to ensure that your team is making progress. We present to the whole group. We do that so that we, uh, if there's a, if you run into an issue or a challenge, we can come together as a group to assist you. And the other catch is the only time that your mentors will be presenting are two times. They're going to present tonight, given their pitches, and then they're going to present a second time on Tuesday during our Tuesday morning check-in where they will actually present their team trailers, which is very much like a gift to the team so that we can open up our viewer's choice. But you'll learn about that a little bit later. Now, let me, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a look at the participants window right now. And I wanna ask the question using the, uh, using the reactions, how many of you all is this your first hackathon? Don't worry, nothing's gonna happen to you. We just wanna, we wanna applaud you. Yes, so congratulations. Thank you, thank you for joining us, thank you. Um, this slide that you're looking at right now, oh, it's quite a few of you all. We're glad to see you and we have some, some hand claps for you as well. Don't worry, we're here to support you. Having said that, this slide that you're, you're looking at right now uh, is, is important because it's gonna let you know how things are gonna go. And <laughs> the way it's gonna go is basically tonight, our focus is picking your project and getting to know your group. So mentor pitches and team formation. Tomorrow, we want you to introduce your group. Tell us who you are and then let us know what your goals are and what your plan is. And then Sunday, we basically just go, hey, are you all okay? <laughs> is everybody okay? We see if there's any adjustments we need to make, any, any resources we need to pull in. And the same thing again happens on Monday. On Tuesday, we get to see those mentor trailers and then we have final presentations on Tuesday night. Now, having said that, that's about 96 hours. About 96 hours. Um, so we're gonna spend about seven hours in planning and check-ins, making sure that you all are on track, make sure everything's okay. We want you to rest. <laughs> we want you to sleep. The mentors also know this. We wanna make sure you get rest. So you should get around about 30 hours of sleep. And that leaves about 59 hours of work time. What that means is you may have very large goals, but they may tend to scope down as you get into it and focus in on, on one particular project. And that is normal. But having said that, you can't save the world in 60 minutes. <laughs> Up 60 minutes. Woo. 60 in 60 hours. And we want you to be aware of that. And so we want you to have some realistic expectations of yourself and to know that, um, we will support you and help you as much as we can, but we want you to leave room for yourself to rest. This is a marathon, not a sprint. Please leave room for your, to take care of yourself, to rest, take in fluids, get food. If you're getting frustrated, step. you might have to step away, take a walk outside just to get some fresh air and sun, hopefully where you are, and then come back to the problem. But don't worry, like I said, if you're stuck, we are here for you. And don't get me wrong. You might start looking like uh, Grotto there in the beginning, but then you may look like Master Yoda. But that includes, as Charlie says, the wisdom and experience that comes along with it. So it's a good thing. It's a good thing. I think what now, Jamie's trying to say, you're, you're not going to age 900 years in these next 60 hours. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> that is very correct. Now, what we're going to expect from your teams. This is one of those screens that uh, if you want to look at it on the PDF, of course, you can look at it on the PDF and grab it from there or uh, screenshot this, this, this screen and it will also be on the website. What we expect from you all, the deliverables on Tuesday night. And they are a GitHub repository. If you do not, uh, if you've never used GitHub before or if you have some concerns using it, don't worry, we're gonna have a little bit of an overview tomorrow available to your teams, uh, those that wish to join. 
uh, to go over a, a straightforward way of accessing GitHub through the, through the website. So we will have that available to you. The, uh, you'll have to create a custom readme.md, so readme.markdown file to provide information on your product, uh, product your project. Any source code, you, and you also want to make sure you put comments in there in your source code, good programming. <laughs> want to add comments in there. Um, also, a, a PDF copy of your presentation slide deck, and that should include your team members, your mentors with pictures, your use of technology in the project, uh, including HPC technology, and the project impact to the pandemic science community. Now, we are having a discussion. And you know what? I'm going to make, I'm going to use, like I said, we're a family. So we're going to have a quick family meeting. Y'all ready for a quick family meeting? Here's our quick family meeting. I'm going to, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to look into the, your eyes. Now I'm going to go to the participants window and I am going to clear all of the reactions. I'm clearing all the reactions using this setting, right? This setting, right? It's not there. Where is it? I thought I had a clear reaction. Oh, that's because all of them are, are cleared. Excellent. So here's the question. So those of you that are kind of, kind of listening, but you weren't ready to click something, it's time to click something. This is your turn to participate. Dr. Hayden, you're the one that is leading the charge with our judges. So here's my idea, Dr. Hayden. I think the students should also do a poster. Now here's the catch though. I also want them to do a presentation. So I want to add some extra points to the judging form for their poster. And by extra points, I'm thinking maybe five points. Is that, a, I see her shaking her head. So Dr. Hayden said, it's okay. So now I'm gonna ask my family here as a bonus. And of course I'll add it to the deliverables. Would you all be okay with adding a poster if your team does the poster, you all get an additional five points added to your overall score. Are we talking one, five points extra credit, Jamie? Or are we talking five additional judging points? Five additional judging points. So five additional judging points. So when you present, if your team does a poster, and I'll even, get, I will do a template for you. So all you have to do is drag and drop. There'll be an additional five points. So what do y'all say? What say you? I think we may need to give them an example of what a presentation poster looks like since a lot of these students are undergraduates and they've probably right. never seen one before. So not a problem. We'll have, will... have to put together a uh, training session for that. Yes. Right. We will do that. We will give them okay. a, uh, the template and discuss how it should be filled in. I uh, will do that. Really good to have that uh, when you go back to your uh, various colleges in the spring. They have research weeks. They have other opportunities within the department for you to present and mm -hmm. be ready to go. And the side note is by doing posters, you'll be able to uh, add your project for various conferences like ADME or mm -hmm. supercomputing or a, well, uh, and let me ask Kelly, because I'm not sure in pandemic science, what are some of the, the important conferences with pandemic science, within the pandemic science community? Uh, I'm not the one to ask that, but Emily, Jose, they can answer that. But you can actually, there are a number of conferences that you could go to for almost any of this stuff. And if you have your poster showing that you uh, have something to share with that community, then you'll find the opportunity for travel support and other mm -hmm. kinds of uh, ways that you can participate with that community. For instance, I know for a fact that the ADME ADMI conference is in March, is that correct, Doc, in Atlanta? Uh, it's in Atlanta, and it is late March to early April. I'll check it and post it. So just putting that out there, but I will add that information. It'll be additional five points, and we'll have a template for you, and we may even have a session to help you out with that as well. Mm -hmm. Having said that, resources. Tonight, you're going to learn about Project Eureka. Jamie. You have uh, yes. Uh, screen screen share. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I am just going at it here. There we go. I think that is going to be amazing. That's what I'm here for, you know. Here mm. we go. 
here we go. All right, so we have our screen back. So some of our resources, Project Eureka, uh, Boyd will be going over that here very shortly. Uh, additionally, we have our TAC, Frontera, and Lone Star 6 computational systems in which we also have uh, portal access to where we can actually fire up Jupyter Notebooks, uh, RStudio, these are, uh, as well as uh, flat Linux desktop, uh, these are uh, products that uh, are available to you. And I know for a fact, if you're on, if you choose Kelly's project, you will be using that. Um, having said that, Charlie, if you wouldn't man, mind adding to chat, both the portal, uh, the TAC portal and the form, the form that once they have their TAC account, uh, we can add them to the allocation so that they can use them. Uh, you also have access to the mobility data set. Now that data set is only available on tax systems. It's actually, uh, it was actually purchased through a company called SafeGraph. Um, Kelly was actually, you know what, Kelly, I love the way you said it. How much is that data set worth, Kelly? If we were a, a, a standard consumer driven company that needed access to this mobility data set, how much would we be paying? Over a hundred million dollars. Wow. Yeah. Data is need, data is very premium these days. I, I needed a sip of water on that one. <laughs> data is worth money. And this data is highly proprietary. And of course, you hear the value that's behind it. Um, that data set you can only use on the tax systems because of that proprietary nature of that data set but I want you to know that it is there and available for you. Some of the commonly used languages uh, from some of our past hacks have been Python, RStudio, Jupyter Notebooks, Node.js, HTML, CSS, Colab, so Google Colab for shared uh, programming, as well as Repolit and Kaggle, uh, the, and even inside of GitHub, uh, CodeMaker. And then most importantly, our Discord server. Now our Discord server, the reason I, I, I dropped down and I slowed down to say that is because that is gonna be our primary means of communicating with you. Um, as well as when you make your teams, your mentors are gonna create text and or audio channels for you all so that you all can communicate, share screens, uh, you all can share files, links uh, as you're going through this hack. So Discord, if you have not yet joined the Discord server, Join it. Join that Discord server. Go to the roles uh, uh, channel. Make sure you select what role you are in this hackathon so that you have the appropriate uh, permissions. Now, just as a quick reminder, I told you about those TAC computational resources. Charlie has been kind enough to drop this link inside of chat. And so if you do not have a TAC account yet, please go to tac.utexas.edu in the top right-hand corner, click in, click on login and account, create account, and make sure when you fill that account out that you do not use a Gmail, Yahoo, or Hotmail address if at all possible. Preferably, please use your institutional email, your .edu email address uh, so that we can get you through that process as soon as possible. Once you created it, you're on, yeah. oh, go ahead. And one note on that creation. Once you do create that, there will be two email notifications. Each of them will contain a link that you have to click on to activate your account. One is to say that your account's been successfully completed, and the other one will have you set up your, your MFA and put you on the project. So there will be two emails for you to look out for. And you have to open and click on both of those links for your account to become active. Yes. And I want to stress that again, both emails that you receive, you have to click on the link in, internally in order for your account to be completely uh, viable and ready. Once you have that account set up, please go to forms.google.com. You have the link there. And Charlie, if you wouldn't mind dropping that into chat to provide us with your TAC username and or if you have an issue with that TAC username, uh, so that we can get you taken care of and add it to that allocation. I keep saying that word allocation. Allocation again is a project that it, it basically gives, attaches uh, almost like a credit card for you to use uh, the two systems, uh, Frontera and Lone Star 6. If you have any issues, please let us know. 
moving on. So I have a screenshot here of Project Eureka because I think it's cool. It, it kind of gives you an idea that you can fire off different things. But instead of me going in and showing you things, I'm going to take a moment and let one of our sponsors, Omnivine, and their CEO, Boyd Wilson, actually give us a little bit of an overview. So if you don't mind, Boyd, I'm actually going to stop sharing. And sir, I am going to hand the floor over to you. So Boyd. Uh, for Excellent. the next, for the next, let's say fifteen to twenty minutes, the floor is yours. Yeah, well, we'll see if I even take that long. Um, so, I just want to give a little bit of background about Project Eureka. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We developed a product several years ago, and we've used in previous hackathons called Cloudy Cluster, and it allows you to launch HPC environments in the cloud and. You know, after the, the experience of doing that and talking to customers and and, and doing that, we, we have started down the path of building what we're calling Project Eureka. And Project Eureka kind of goes beyond what the original Cloudy Cluster did. And we really tried to embrace um, interactive computing as part of it. And as part of the, the design process and development process, we actually started what I call an inside out development cycle. And so instead of building the admin tools and building all these other pieces, we started with the user experience, you know, the most day-to-day -day user experience. So, and, and then we'll get to other things. This is actually a work in progress. We've used this already for a couple of other hackathons. This is a build from a couple of weeks ago. If anyone's coming to supercomputing, come by and say hi, we'll show us, you know, show you our latest build. Um, we have some cool stuff that we, we've added since this, but this is the one we used in the Gateways Hackathon. Um, and one prior, what was the other one? I can't remember what that one was. Um, and, but, but the whole goal here and, and part of the reason I told you about the development cycle is as we've done these hackathons, we really wanted to make something that worked well in a hackathon environment and eventually it'll work well in a, in a classroom environment. But again, this is a, a work in progress. This is probably not even considered alpha, um, but it's, it's stable for what it does. It runs well. There's just a lot of features that aren't in there yet where we want to, you know, before we call it a, a beta, alpha, beta, or 1.0. Um, so really what you start with is a, a project interface. And I only have one project in here because the teams haven't been created yet. And once the teams get created, we'll populate them and we'll add the users um, to each of the teams. Now, everybody here or at least in the spreadsheet that we had, um, has an account. And just so you know, the, the accounts to log in um, will be your first initial and your last name all mushed together. And then your phone number that's in that spreadsheet without any dashes or anything will be the um, password. And so everyone will, you know, should have an account. If, if you don't have one, just hit us in Discord um, and say something. We have a couple of developers monitoring that. I have family in town, so I'm, you know, we're all going to the football game tomorrow. So but I'll, I'll be keeping an eye on my phone, but you never know how signal is at a football game, you know how that goes. Uh, so, but but there are, you know, Mary and Jeff will be monitoring things. So, and and Amy will will be as well. So we, we can track down help if it's, if it's needed. And I'll be looking at things tonight. So I just wanted to kind of walk you through what you have. So this is the demo project. Um, once I create all these projects after you create the teams each team will have a project the members in it will have access to it and then you'll go in so if you go into a project you have you know several different launchers we call them and it allows you to launch different applications now this is a skin that not really a skin but this is a, a user interface a project user interface that runs on top of open on demand and leverages open on demands um features and and per user x engine process or you know per user processes that run an engine x and so you can actually you know it, it's a nice environment we've been collaborating with the open on demand team for a, a number of years um actually we, we met at a, a gateways conference several years ago before the pandemic which was kind of interesting anyway so so within your project you have these different applications and we'll set up 
all the applications for you inside of those. And, and I just like a baking show, I went through and I started some of these so we don't have to wait. They take you know a couple three minutes because each one of these launches an individual instance in the cloud, and then using open on demands proxy capability, you can just access them from the web. So if I wanted to connect to this desktop here, I just say connect. And then right there, there's a Linux desktop. I can allow the clipboard and I can go see things. Yeah, you can drag stuff around. It's pretty responsive. BNC does a good job with that. And if I wanted to do Jupyter, now this is a desktop. She's using BNC. So when you connect to Jupyter, it's actually using that proxy and actually connecting directly to Jupyter Lab. And what's also interesting is the, the shared storage behind this, the home directory that you have is shared amongst all these different systems. So when you save something to your home directory, everybody has it. And, and the home directory is configured by default, so you don't have to go look for it to do other things. And just another example here is VS Code Server. And so there's VS Code Server. That's a cosmetic error right there. Um, and then, so that, then you can go in and, and run those different applications all, all from a project and everybody can have a shared space that you can move stuff to and from um, and everything. And there's also our studio down there. And you also have a shared file space. So not only do you have the home directory, this is actually using um, IRODs behind the scenes and its API. So you can copy data up here, other people can see it, and, and then you know it gives you the ability to access it. And you can also access it from the shell. So there's a web shell right here that you can log into. And then again, there's that same home directory. So you can go in and access these, these, these various different things. Um, and so you can really run and, and do these things. So we, we just make this available for the hackathons, um, to give you an idea to how, how it works a little bit. So if I go into the project and we'll say, um, okay, let's add a launcher. So this is how you configure the launchers. You get a list of applications. Um, you want to make another one for spider, and then you can choose the different instance types. And you can even choose GPUs. Now, the one thing is that there's no funding covering this. Omnibond's paying for all these cloud resources. So if you need a GPU, reach out, ask. We'll make sure you get set up with one. And, and the other thing you'll want to do, but generally most people can just run with this T3, two cores, and everything runs just fine. Um, but if you need something a little beefier, you know, reach out and we can help and make sure. But if you do use something, um, you do want to make sure that you learn how to use this pause button over here. We've changed the UI a little bit since then. So, but let's say if I wanted to pause Jupiter, I hit pause. It'll actually stop the instance. Um, and so any data that's on the, you know, if you if you put stuff on the underneath the, the on the system itself, or if you installed some libraries or things within Jupyter that'll all just kind of catch that state on disk and, and stop it. But you won't have to pay for the, or we won't have to pay for the, the processing time. Then after a couple minutes, then you can just, this will turn into a play button, then you start it back up, and then you can go in and after it's launched, you can connect to it just like the other ones. And so what we're doing, we'll have one of these created for each of the projects. Everyone will have a login um, and we'll get that set up later tonight once all the, the teams are selected. Did I miss anything, Jamie? I don't think so, except for one thing, Boyd. <laughs> How do we get to it? Oh, I'll send a link <laughs> to this. And I didn't. We didn't make a DNS thing because we're kind of frantically getting ready for supercomputing. But yeah, you just go to this URL right here, and and I did, and and you will get a privacy error because there is no cert, because there is no DNS, just go ahead and proceed. You'll get a login like this. You'll do that, then you'll log in, and then it'll take you to, to it'll actually take you to this page right here. Um, 
and then and you see this is stopped right here so you can actually hit play and then it'll start it up again um Thanks. so anyway yeah but I'll, I'll paste this in the link i'll put it in discord and i'll so once we get the teams all created what we'll paste all that and we'll remind everybody what the, the login information is and then Jamie and others have access to that spreadsheet. So if we messed up a phone number, if we messed up a name, we can figure out what the user ID is. Not a problem. And would you mind saying that one more time, just so that people in general know what to expect when they log in or what their username and password should be? Yeah. The username is the first initial and your last name all smushed together. And the password will be the phone number without any dashes, hyphens, or anything or parentheses in it, just just the numbers. Excellent. All right. Now I do, I want to take a minute, if you all wouldn't mind, let's give uh Omnibon a hand. We want to say thank you so much. I know that you're all a part of the uh, part of the Hack HPC uh, organizing committee and things, but as Boyd said, Omnibon is actually paying for this out of pocket. Uh, for you all to have access to these uh, these computational services. Um, even if your project doesn't use, uh, might not use uh, Project Eureka as the final outcome, I would suggest you at least log in, maybe fire off a Jupyter Notebook instance or a, a VS Code or even just a Linux desktop just to see how it works. Um, in the background for this particular setup is actually uh, uh, using Amazon Web Services. But I know for a fact that um, uh, Boyd looks cool and calm right here, but underneath that Zoom square, his legs and hands are just going like a duck in water because they are preparing for supercomputing, uh, that, which will take place in about two weeks, wherein hopefully they will also be on another platform. Am I, am I okay to say that, Boyd? Yeah. Okay, that hopefully they will be, uh, this project Eureka will actually be up and functional on uh, the Google Cloud platform as well. So it's actually multi-platform, uh, which is really, really cool. If you've never used a, a cloud computer before, this is your chance. And it's a very easy on-ramp. And again, we thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks, Boyd. Let me say I, one I, more thing I forgot in my little spiel. Anything saved in the home directories will always be there. So when I click end here and say, okay, that deletes that compute instance, but that doesn't delete any data in the home directory. It only deletes data that you might've downloaded or things you installed to Jupyter. So That's awesome. it, if you're not using stuff, you can delete it, but everything is still in the home directory. So I just wanted to say that real quick. Thank you. That's actually a really important thing. That means that you could, let's say that you're doing a mixture of Jupyter and Spider, and then you're doing some stuff in Linux and the bash shell, so on command line, all that home directory is available or that data set is available across the instances. That makes life so much easier. So thank you, Boyd. Thank you for pointing that out. That is a big, a very big deal. So thank you again. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Oh, thanks, boy. And please, please don't forget, give us the link. We need the link. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll send the link out after we, because once you make the teams, we'll we'll create the teams, then I'll send the link out again. Perfect. Perfect. And I'll send it to you just in case. How about that? <laughs> that works. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So having said that, we have been talking for about an hour now. Now, I, I don't know about you all, but uh, my... Uh, my uh, uh, ability to stay focused sometimes needs a little time to uh, to warm up, to, to, to de-stress and then come back. So before we begin with our mentor pitches, what I want to do is I want to give us, uh, again, I, told, I warned you all about my numbers. It is what it is. I want to give you all seven minutes, that's seven minutes to stretch your legs, Refill your coffee, refill your water, and then we'll come back. We'll have our mentor pitches, and then we'll have our team formations, and we'll be done for the night. Okay? So let's take 10. Uh, ten. Let's take seven minutes, and then we will get started afterwards. I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording. All right. Welcome back from our break. 
And as you can see by the screen, it is about time for us to enter in and see our mentor pitches. Now, before I do that, I do want to say thank you to all of our mentors and staff that are, are so kindly giving up of their, their time, their resources, their efforts in order to um, participate with this event over the, uh, over the course of this weekend. Um, of course, we're going to be hearing uh, from them directly here soon, um, but I just want to, to slow down and take, take this moment again to say thank you. Um, not only do, uh, uh, do, of course, I appreciate it and the organizing committee, but also the students with which you're going to be working or with whom you're going to be working uh, over this uh, weekend. Thank you all so much. Now, for the students, for those that are going to be hacking over the course of this weekend, you're going to hear from, I believe, three different mentors. There's one group that's actually going to be together, so it'll be two mentors working together. What you need to do, or what we need you to do, is as you hear each presentation, we want you to pick two that you're interested in, at least two, and put them down in order. After the mentor pitches, what we're going to do is we're going to open up breakout rooms and then you vote with your feet. You get to select which project you would like to work on based upon which breakout room you select. Now, we may have some breakout rooms to end up a little bit larger. If they do, what well, we have ways of working with that where we can kind of balance it out. But it may be a, uh, it may, we may also have to uh, kind of balance out the groups a little bit. Uh, by asking you to choose, some of you all to choose your second choice as well. So that's the way team formation is actually going to happen. So you're going to hear these mentor pitches and you're going to pick, you're going to write down two, your top two. You're going to go, we're going to create breakout rooms. You're going to go to those breakout rooms and then uh, we'll, we'll balance out the groups as necessary as we go in. But we want you to get, hopefully you'll be able to get your your number one choices. Now, I did something different this year. I, I, I have I have really been getting into to AI generated images. I, I don't know why. It's an interesting thing to do. And so, Charlie, you're gonna love this. Each of these images that you see in front of you were generated based on the prompt. Create a picture to represent this idea, and then I put in quotes the first sentence of the description of the project. And these are the images that actually came up for your for your different projects. Um, when you see Kelly's, yeah, that's pretty much, you think that's pretty much on point, Kelly? <laughs> now, uh, now for the other, uh, for the other mentors, Emily, do you think that's pretty on point for you all? I guess maybe the computer one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and some behavior stuff, I would imagine, hospitalization stuff. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't really like say Reddit data, but it seems like it says something. <laughs> good. Good. I, like I say, when I saw these pictures, I was like, that, that's kind of neat. That's kind of neat. Anyway, I had to put that out there. Uh, I actually created these images using the Bing image creator. Um, kind of neat. Made me feel like I'm, I'm, an, art, I'm an artiste. <laughs> But having said that, we're going to invite up our first mentor uh, presentation, and that presentation is actually being done by uh, Dr. Kelly Gaither. So Kelly, the floor is yours. All right. So hi, guys. We are going, if you work with me, uh, you're going to be having a messy situation over the next four or five days. Um so just a little background, mass gatherings are defined as large numbers of people greater than a thousand. That's actually defined by the CDC, congregating at a specific location for a specific purpose. They can be formal like planned events, or they can be informal like protests and, and uh, political events. So attendees, you may not really realize this, but attendees at mass gatherings face unique risks due to a variety of factors, environmental hazards, challenging security situations, increased risk for infectious 
disease transmission. If you look over at the right, those are all of the factors that you kind of have to think about when you're when you're looking at planning a mass gathering or being able to accommodate one. So if you are on this team, we are going to look at the mobility data, the safe graph mobility data, and try and identify mass gatherings that occurred from 2018 through February 2022. It's all anonymized, so we're not really big brother looking at anybody's individual patterns, but we're going to look at travel patterns and demographics estimated from the census data and compare it to past events. So if you have critical thinking skills, programming or analysis skills, or even just research skills, and you want to get a little more experience in looking at this data and creating perhaps dashboards, animations, maps, uh, or even, dare we say, posters, uh, then come join us and have a, a massy situation kind of weekend. Excellent. Thank you, Kelly. Now I do want I do want to leave a little room for uh for any questions that you all may have of this mentor. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Don't get you're going to be able to to speak with her directly, but I just want to make sure. All right, and of course you can unmute yourself or add it to chat. Either way, it's perfectly fine. Either way, okay, not a problem. So Kelly's project will be listed as breakout room, massy situation, massy situation. I can also tell you something else. I know for a fact that Miss Gladys Chen will be joining Kelly as her co-mentor and a technical expert. So massy situation, massy situation. All right, moving on. Up next. Jose, Jose, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, hello everyone. It's nice to see you. And uh, for this project, I am going to be working with you guys about mobility and social vulnerability index. The main idea is that we are going to tackle the problem of disproportionate uh, burden of COVID in a city of the United States, in this case, of in the Travis County. So in previous research, we have found out that uh, there has been a disproportionate burden of COVID in the city. And as you can see, there was a large number of reported cases in the city, in some sectors of the city, a uh, large number of hospitalizations, and also a very high cumulative uh, uh, infection in the city, but it was all gather in the east now on the other hand high percentages of infection hospitalization rate and also reporting rates were uh, accumulated in the uh, west of the city so this disproportionate uh, impact actually affected the city in a very uh, interesting way what we are going to try to do in this project is to uh, tackle the problem of mobility and social vulnerability index. So we're going to use safe graph data to ask uh, how is the mobility between the zip codes in the city of Austin related to the social vulnerability index of each of these zip codes, which we are going to uh, be using. Also, we're going to ask, is this relationship depending on the mobility restrictions? Because we have data from 2000, uh, safe graph data from 2019, all the way to 2020 because we are going to be interested in the stringent mobility uh, restrictions in the city. So we're going to try to understand uh, how uh, different zip codes moved during the stringent restrictions and how they uh, moved uh, in the absence of restrictions. And for this, we're going to say as we're going to use, as I said, social vulnerability index data that uh, is calculated from the American Community Survey and also the mobility data that is uh, uh, that comes from SafeRap uh, about visits to points of interest, so interactions between zip codes. So, uh, well, I hope to get to see you in the later uh, because this is going to be a very, very nice uh, project to work on. Oh my goodness, thank you. I um I don't know what to say. 
I never really thought about it like that, that uh, based on um, your social, well, based on social uh, matters that we could be affected or, or could have been greater uh, affected by, uh, by COVID restrictions. Um, and then the fact that you're actually going to focus here on, in Austin, um, in, in Travis County, I cannot wait to see what your team comes up with and to see how it, I really can't wait to see how you're going to visualize it. I think I'm more excited to see how you're going to visualize it than anything else. So um, I, yes, I am very much looking forward to it. You're more than welcome to join our group. <laughs> oh, oh, you're recruiting. I see how that works. Okay. No problem. Um, are there any questions for the, uh, for this mentor? Oh my goodness. Okay, so I do have one question for you. Do you, now keep in mind, teams, I want to tell you right now, whatever direction you decide to go is up to you. But having said that, do you think, uh, or what program do you think uh, the students are going to, uh, or, or in your mind, you kind of see the students using? Is it more Python or RStudio or, or what have you, what have you considered? I think well, uh, according to my familiarity to uh, to this particular problem, I think that our studio might be a better a, a better uh, yeah a better software. However, it doesn't it doesn't matter. It depends only on the skills of the student. But um, I would definitely uh, uh, go after our studio. But again, it's okay. Python or our studio, both are okay. But yes, we're going to be we're going to be producing very interesting and nice maps and figures as well. Excellent, excellent. Now I do want to say this out loud. So you've uh, you all have heard of us heard us talking about several different programming uh, or, or programming resources over tonight. So we've talked about Python, which is is a uh, written programming language or a scripted language. Um, uh, we've talked about Jupyter Notebooks, which is a uh, basically a not only can you use Python within Jupyter Notebooks, but then you can also use rich text, which it actually uses a language called Mark, uh, Markdown language. Uh, and then, but then also R could actually be used within Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, so all of these tools are, are gonna be fascinating. But having said that, I'd like to ask, um, because R Studio isn't always as well known, um, would someone mind kind of letting us know what they think or, or how they see our studio as a program, kind of linked to some other program that may be a little bit more familiar? I've, well, I've coded in R before. Uh, if somebody else has coded in R, feel free to in our chat. Can you kind of link it to another, when you think about our studio, yes. is there so, another more? familiar program you can you think it's so similar R to studio, R, you, you're talking about the actual interface the r studio interface not just the r program it's, it reminds me a lot of matlab in some cases mm -hmm. uh, but so if you have some matlab you might have some experience you might have some um, you might look familiar to you when you fire up r studio and look at it for the first time but r is a programming language uh to me it, it's, it's kind of similar like similar to python but more focused on doing data stuff uh right. plus it's got this really really cool graphical or, or um visualization tool or visualization i would say uh um topic called uh what's it called not vocabulary of graphs it is i can't think of the term right now but it's just a way of creating graphs almost as if you're <clears throat> almost as if you're putting together a sentence uh, so it's really really cool the way you put build the canvas and then add the points and then add how you want to show the points and just layer on layer on layer. And it's really sweet and really slick the way it works. So I saw Gladys shaking her head. Do you, do you want to add anything to that Gladys? Yeah. Our yes, studio is very intuitive, very beginner friendly. It's more like a statistical side of it. There's a lot of interfaces that you can just click and see what the data set looks like. So yeah, Python or our studio would be a good fit for someone that's start, just starting out learning visualization. Excellent. And I want to I throw out there. Second. And in the oh. chat, uh, Evan said is very similar to Spider. That's absolutely true. And also from the chat, Hector, you're absolutely right. This is a hackathon. 
Uh, part of the goals is to introduce yourselves to some new technologies that you may have never used before and just to get familiar with them and, you know, see what fits and see what clicks into the right place. So, yeah, great point, Hector. All right, I heard somebody else that was saying something. I didn't want to want them to get lost in the sauce here. Uh, this is me, Tal. I was actually just going to second what Hector said. This is an opportunity to learn, so don't let the specific technology intimidate you. You have great mentors here who will help you, um, and you can use your strengths, you know, and, and learn new things. So please don't be discouraged if you haven't interacted with something before. Thank you, Mato. I agree. And I want to add one other thing to it. MATLAB costs. Our studio is open source. Just saying. That's all I'm saying. Having said that, Again, Jose, thank you so much for your presentation. You will find this project in the breakout rooms under mobility, social vulnerability. So we had massy situation with Kelly's project where she is going to dig into those data sets. And then we also have, uh, we have Jose that's going to do mobility and social vulnerability. Let's put, push forward to our final presentation. I, I, I remembered it. It's grammar of graphics. That's what it's called. Grammar it's called of graphics. GG plot in R. Grammar of graphics. Sorry. Excellent. Right. Excellent. And back to our normal program. <laughs> <laughs> and to throw this word out there, not this word. I don't know why I say throw this word out there. I am going to attempt to say a name. If I tear this name up, please charge it to my tongue, not my heart. <laughs> Aluwasigun, Aluwasigun, and Emily will now present information on using Reddit data for pandemic preparedness. So, Aluwasigun and Emily, the floor is you all's. Yes, yeah, so Aluwasigun is not here. He had a previous commitment, so it's just me presenting for both of them but they are essentially on very similar data sets. Um, what we have is a Reddit text data. So if you're not familiar with Reddit, it is just kind of like a social media platform where people post um, information, like maybe an article, and then people comment and respond to it, then upvote, downvote. And they have quite niche uh, subreddits of like, I only like, you know, puppies like two weeks old. So you can only post these puppies here, right? So it's a huge range. And so this is the data up to, I think, early 2023. So it, and back to probably, I think, 2017 is what's in here or 2020, but at least covers the full pandemic. And so the goals of this project is really to analyze this text data and understand can we, using these conversations, so like the text of the post and the comments replied, um, to track cum community opinions due to uh, pandemic-related policies? So for those of you around the rest of the world, we are in Austin, Texas, and Austin, Texas had a staged alert system in which if certain thresholds were reached, we would say, okay, actually COVID cases are increasing in a way that it's increasing hospitalizations. And we're gonna move from a like low color to a different color. And what comes with that is some suggestions that like if you are in a high risk group, you should be wearing a mask in public. It, there's so much disease spread. And then if we go into a high group, it's something like everybody should be wearing a mask. And that's actually gonna be a requirement. And very early on in the pandemic, there were other things like no mass gatherings, you know, no going to restaurants and things like that and different suggestions that weren't always able to be enforced. But what you'd be analyzing is kind of text data about what people have posted and how maybe they were perceiving the policy, whether or not they even knew there was a shift in policy. We had plenty of people very well educated in the city who had no idea we even had staged alert system. So you're just getting a snapshot of anybody involved in the Austin area subreddit and how they felt 
about anything <laughs> and try to pull out from their language things about pandemic related policies and sentiment and things like that. And then a separate project you could also work on is same Reddit data is about um, community pandemic preventative behaviors. So this would be not so much like a policy issued by the city, but some you could still analyze like how do people feel about masking? Are they willing to do it? So you could also say, how do people feel about vaccination once it became available? Are they willing to do it? Once a new public health, you know, message or something came out, how divisive does it seem like people are? Like, do we have a lot of polarization that's increasing, you know, in language through time? Things like that. And there's data involved is like knowing the timeline of the Austin policies, if you want to do that one. The actual pull of the date of the text post, there's some analysis that's already been done there for you, different columns of like, how much did the people say like the word we or I, you know, certain types of words and phrases you might be interested in, as well as these two links are a bunch of just anywhere on the internet. I've basically found um, different COVID related sources of data. So like weekly hospitalizations or other kinds of things. So this would be very much using text data to relate it to some observed outcome in the real world. So whether or not that's vaccination throughout the city or things like that. All right. Is that, oh, okay. All right. And so thank you so much, Emily. And also thank you for presenting for, uh, for your fellow mentor. Uh, I heard you say it. Alu wash. Yeah, wash. the S is kind of like a sh, like a shigun. He kind of goes by shigun as well. Shigun. So Alu wash shigun. Mm -hmm. Okay. So hey, thank James, you for, just for a quick little bit of clarity. Are these going to be two different projects? Or are they going to be one project that has a, a part one and a part two? It sounds um, like. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead. Oh yeah. So like two different projects. Um, he's not here to present his, but I'll be out all of tomorrow. And so he'll probably be like, we'll both be available mentors for anybody who's involved with the Reddit data and probably things that one team, you know, develops or finds can share to the other one. Like it's a very, you know, sharing environment. So I wouldn't worry about it. Or even if you think the data is interesting, but you don't like these questions, you know, you could do anything you wanted with this data is fine. And so what I'm what I'm hearing here is that there are two there are two projects here there are two mentors and they're 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 supporting each other um, because of life happens we all know that life happens and so you all are supporting each other but because you all's projects both rely on a Reddit data set that sounds like your two teams could actually work together especially in the beginning to to gather those data sets so it can be a a, a dual team uh process to actually gather the data sets and then you all could split in order to to accomplish your different tasks now having said that i am going to put a requirement on your team oh yes i am i'm going to write it down <laughs> the requirement because you all's teams are so closely close knitted that means that the theme between your two teams have to somehow connect. And what I mean by that is specifically in your team introductions tomorrow, in the two teams introducing themselves, the two teams themes, their background, their team song, their team names have to link somehow. Now, how you're going to do that, I have no idea, but good luck. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to it. We really are looking forward to it. Um, but also- if we have two teams. There might be only enough people that make sense to have one team, which is totally fine too. <laughs> sounds like you're hoping. Sounds like you're hoping, but I don't know. We're going to find out. Yeah. But so, also, either also, way. Uh, so with this data set, so unlike the other two projects as well, the Reddit data 
you all have to gather, which means that you all could actually use Project Eureka or TAC resources either way. Um, is that is that correct? We have the data um, in a like parsable kind of just big, big C CSV, um, comma separated values. So it's just a big like table um, there for you. And so you can see like the user ID, what they posted, and, you know, kind of the ratings people gave it and felt about it and then different like words and analyzed from that. And so it's a big document through time and it's all just people who post in the Reddit subreddit doesn't necessarily mean they for sure live here. <laughs> we don't know. Yeah. So is the data accessible uh, outside of TAC resources? It is. Yeah, it's in a box. So okay. I have that in a box folder that can just be downloaded. It is big though. So I would still maybe, yeah, this would be a good time to use your cloud computing. Don't fry your little machine or, you know, we can put it on tack. Um, that's not a problem. Whatever language you code in, I can help you make like a little Docker singularity, you know, container to run your stuff on tack. So whatever packages and things you need to do what you want to do, it's not a problem. Don't worry about that. Fantastic. And I will yeah, actually uh, add something else to that. I, I was going to say, know, Gordon Evans on uh, chat. Um, okay. I'm sorry, Jamie. I thought you were talking to me. My oh, bad. No, no, go, go ahead. Right. No, no, go uh, ahead. It's been said about that it's about one gigabyte of data. So, okay, yeah. not, a, not a problem. And if you remind me, I know for a fact I have some documentation that I wrote for another user on how to transfer data from Box into onto tech and that same document should also work for um the basics of it should actually or the general version of it should also work for project eureka so either way we can get that data where it needs to go um perfect all right and this project or these two projects i should say will be listed in the breakout rooms as Reddit data for pandemic prep. <laughs> so Reddit data number four, pandemic prep. Now, before I open the rooms, I want to tell you uh, two last things. So go, go ahead and start. Remember, get your, your first uh, one that you want to select. And actually, let me back up before I do that. So let's go back to the beginning. Our first project uh, by Dr. Kelly Gaither, a massy situation. Uh, where she will actually be taking a look at uh, the different unique uh, the different unique risks that come uh, come about based to uh, based on environmental hazards. Uh, so this project is, and you see actually a little uh, simulation of that over there. So that will be interesting. Now the deliverables it could be anything from a dashboard to maps. Uh, along with that of mass gatherings and, of course, the associated factors that may uh, make them a bad idea, perhaps, mayhaps. <laughs> Number two, we have mobility and social vulnerability of Jose, uh, where he will actually be mapping out uh, some of the uh, vulnerabilities uh, that go along with being uh, when we're in a pandemic situation where we may have to uh, stay in our homes wherein others are not able to do that. And of course, uh, he's going to be taking a look at the social vulnerability index that goes along with that. And last but not least, our dual project, uh, possibly uh, dealing with Reddit data uh, for uh, pandemic preparedness that was just presented by Emily. Uh, so uh, those are your three choices. And like I said, that third one actually has a little sub shoot off that goes on. And even though they have given us their babies that are beautiful and, and perfectly formed, you, the teams can turn that beautiful, beautiful, perfectly formed baby into a truck and we will be happy to see it. <laughs> so before we go, before we go, before I open up the breakout rooms, just want to remind you that tomorrow we will have our uh, first check-in, our morning check-in. It will actually take place at 10.30 a.m. Central Time. 
uh, where we will be seeing your team introductions, your team introductions. We are so looking forward to that. And by team introductions, what I am talking about is, and right now I am on our, uh, this is the first time I've ever taken you all to it. So we'll go to it together as a team. I am going to hackhpc.github.io slash HPC in the city 23. And on this site, up at the top right-hand corner, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger because it's probably teeny tiny on your screen. Up at the top, I'm going to go to schedule. And under schedule, as we add things to each one of our sessions, links are there. So we had our mentors overview and all their information is there. Our systems onboarding that took place uh, two days ago and the session videos right there. If you want to take a look at that, if you have any issues getting started along with our data, our example data set and that account form that you need to fill out so that we can add you to the allocation to today where we have our kickoff to tomorrow morning when we'll have our team introductions and what we want in your team introductions. Each team will have one slide, one slide. Gladys, I'm looking at you. One, and Emily, not Emily, uh, uh, <laughs> Emma. I have an Emily and an Emma. I am tore up today. Emma and Gladys, one slide. One, un, un slide. Two? One, un, un slide. Oh. And the team will have one minute to present it. One slide, one minute. And on that slide, you should have your team name, your team mentors, your team members. You all should also pick a team Zoom virtual background. So you can see this wonderful background here that Charlie made with uh, the COVID uh, uh, virus behind me blossoming from the flower as pandemics tend to do. <laughs> See, it tells a story, but you, your team has to have one yeah, and a team theme song. Now I do have specifications for your team theme song. I do not want to get a YouTube copyright strike again. So your team theme song has to come from SoundCloud, SoundCloud, SoundCloud. Saving oh, Hack HPC wow. copyright strikes since 2023. <laughs> I can't understand that. Uh-oh. Don't know but, why. So team name, team members, team members, team Zoom virtual background, team theme song. Your team will be known by this. So take your time. Tonight is all about getting to know your team. Take that time. Take that time. All right. So having said that, I am going to go ahead. I'm going to stop the recording. We're going to open up the breakout rooms to form our teams. And we'll see you in the morning, those watching online. Those that are here, stay here. You got stuff to do. Thank you.